Good morning, everyone. Happy anniversary to us as a church. You know, I gotta confess, there was a there was a church I was on staff at one time that we we had the first song and we called it for real. In staff meetings, we always called it the throwaway song. And the reason we called it the throwaway song because it was the song that nobody was in the room. It's like the song that got everybody to come in the room. So let's not have a throwaway song. Let's let's worship, okay? Let's stand and worship.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How are you guys? Good. You're good? I'm so glad. Happy 20th anniversary. This is actually really exciting. Who's excited? I'm really awake this morning. I had a lot of caffeine this morning, and I'm like really feeling it. Okay, um, we have VBS July 13th through 15th, and you can register online. And then we have a new text message sign up so that you can get updates and things. And you can just text hi to the number on the screen. And then next Sunday is Acts of Harvest and Father's Day. And if you want to spend your Father's Day helping people, you can come and help them. All right, so last week was our last week of school. I know I always talk about school, and I kind of make it seem like a bad place, but I do I do love my school. Um, but we had an award ceremony, and I thought, okay, an award ceremony, like only the people who did extra work get an award. That is not how it works in the public school system. No, everyone gets an award. Um, it doesn't matter if you just did what you were supposed to do. You got multiple awards. I'm pretty sure one person does not need seven awards. Like, I walked up there seven times. And it kind of defeats the point of it, but it made me think about how we often expect to get rewarded for things that we're supposed to be doing. And especially when we're just doing good to other people. And it says in Luke 6, 35, but love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the most high because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. I've noticed a lot of people like to be recognized just for doing good and they expect to be re rewarded for that. But this verse is saying, you know what? Do good, but don't just do good to the people who are good to you. Do good to the people who aren't good to you. And I'm going to be honest, that's hard. But if you want to be more like Jesus, that's what you have to do. And no one said being more like Jesus was easy. Because he did things for really bad people when they didn't deserve it. God does things for us when we don't deserve it. So if you want to be children of the Most High, you have to get over yourself and do good things and be kind to your enemies without expecting anything in return. As we go into prayer, I want you to think about if you are only doing good works to be recognized and rewarded for it, or if you're doing good works for the right reason, which is to be more Christ-like. Amen. She's going to National Fine Arts for preaching, of course. Yeah, no doubt. Why does she not have credentials? <laughs> She'll be on her way, no doubt. Uh, every every Sunday, Ryan looks at me, uh, makes eye contact with me while uh, Lindsay's preaching, and shakes his head because he just feels his toes getting smashed like in it. his sandals every Sunday morning. <clears throat> it happens every Sunday morning. Uh, a few things today. Welcome to New Harvest 20th Anniversary Service today. Amen? Wow. Isn't it incredible? 20 years uh, that we've been a church, and we're so glad uh, for the history and legacy of what God's done here and excited for today. Um, of course, tonight at 6.30 p.m., or 6 p.m., rather, at 6 p.m. tonight, uh, Father Charles Howe will be here preaching. Um, and I told him this was my directions I said, uh, just preach the paint off the walls. That's what you need to do today. and that's uh, So he's coming, and he's willing to do that. So 6 p.m. this evening, of course, we have potluck immediately after service. Um, it's questionable whether it will be outside in the pavilion or down here in this, in this church building um, as to the weather. But um, just be ready for whatever happens. Um, I did want to thank somebody in particular. I wanted to thank uh, Matt uh, Herod. Uh, for all of his hard work getting the property ready over the last couple weeks. Uh, amen. He's been doing a great job. And he's had a lot of help. Absolutely. His son, Matthew. Uh, Kim Lee's been mowing. And, of course, uh, always faithful uh, is our uh, brother there in the back, uh, James Fugate. Um, and, and so thank you all for taking care of the property uh, and, and getting everything ready for this uh, special Sunday. Um, and so right now, before we go into prayer time, we have the absolute honor uh, to uh, bring Taylor and uh, Jacob Wilson up here. And uh, Pastor Joe, this is exciting. I'm going to ask you to pray over them because they are headed uh, to the 
half hour past this the only my only reference is a half hour past Hazard, Kentucky, um, to pastor a global Methodist church. Um, I tried to get him AG, but it, I tried did my best, Pastor. But um, we're s- there we go. Yeah, and so uh, we are going to pray for them and send them on their way. So at this point in time, we want to open it for the opportunity for you to give them an offering as they get uh, ready to move. Um, so all you have to do if you're writing a check or if it's cash or something like that, please put it in an envelope and Mark Taylor and Jacob Wilson uh, or Wilson's or something like that or Heinemann, Kentucky or the mountains or whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, you know where they're going and we'll make sure that the funds get to them. No, <laughs> I'm from northern Kentucky. Right? <laughs> My geography stops at Lexington as far as eastern Kentucky. <laughs> um, and so, uh, Pastor Joe, would you come? And I, can I have uh, some of my prayer partners and prayer warriors and board members and Pastor Hammond and uh, Robert Christman? And if you just feel led to just come pray over uh, this family, if you just have a special love for them. I know Ryan and Kim, of course, do. Um, and uh, we just want to pray over Jacob and Taylor. And uh, do, do you want to say anything, Jacob? I just want to thank um, New Harvest uh, for uh, our time here. We came here um, Easter of last year was our first Sunday. And, uh, of course, Ryan and Kim are, are part of the reason why we came, but you all are the reason why we stayed. And so uh, I thank you. Uh, for your nurturing, your love. Um, I'm just, I just thank you. <laughs> Extend your hands, would you? Father, I thank you for Taylor and Jacob. I thank you for this precious couple who, even in his emotion today, he shows his hunger in his heart for you. Lord, we thank you for the global Methodist standing and being strong in the midst of a turbulent society. And we pray your blessing to the global Methodist. And we pray your blessing to this church in Hyman that they go to. And we pray, oh God, for this couple that whatever they touch will prosper. And Lord, as they bring heart and vision and the word of God, Lord, that you would raise up people underneath their wings, oh God. Father, the, the harvest is plenteous. It is ripe and ready to be picked, but the labors are few. So, God, I pray that you would bless them. I pray that you give them joy unspeakable. Let them always be reminded that, Lord, the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. So, Father, we put a hedge of protection around them today. We send them out for a goodness and a blessing that they might lift your name higher. And, Lord, that we might bring more people to heaven with us. And once again, we thank you for them, for their home. We ask your blessing over them in every way. And the church said, Amen. 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 Thank you so much. One of the favorite things that really, I think, sold Jacob on the... uh, church there in Heinemann is that the parsonage had a goat shed already done and fencing and things like that. So I told him whenever he's ready, I'm coming down to bring him a blessing of a goat as a housewarming present, you know, and I'm going to bring him a a goat to him. (laughs) No, I do. I do have to. (laughs) Every shepherd should have sheep, okay, in the family. (laughs) Well, it's prayer time right now. Uh, are there any prayer requests? Yes, I'm sorry. Anybody need an envelope for an offering for the Wilsons at all? Okay, some over there. Thank you. Uh, just see Robert. Raise your hand for Robert. He'll take care of you. Um, any prayer requests that we need to uh, pray over today as we begin? Yes, Robert. Tell me your name again. Kathy. Kathy. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Yes. I found rags in the hospital room and blood infection. Okay. And you know, your church is strong. Sure. Church is able to help Absolutely. Can you pray for Lewis? Yes. We'll pray for Brad. Absolutely. Lucy? 
Say that again. I'm sorry. My family is Catholic. Sure. Absolutely, pray for them. Yes, ma'am. Julia? Yes, I'll be seeing my husband and kept the family and my daughter. Yes, we'll continue to pray for you. Yes. If you would, uh, those who had physical prayer requests, that you would surround them in prayer when we get to them. And, uh, during this prayer time, we would greatly appreciate that. Everybody ready? Anything else? Let's begin with the Lord's Prayer as we get ready to pray today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive those who have debted against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you that we can come and petition your throne, Lord Jesus, that you are gracious to us, Lord Jesus, that, Father, that we can uh, pray and you hear from on high, and your arm is not too short. You can extend it to us, Lord Jesus, to touch every need. And, Father, we pray for men's uh, family friend, Lord Jesus, that you be with them in the midst of their loss and hardships. And, Father, that your grace would be spread abroad in their hearts, Lord, and that you would bring comfort that surpasses all understanding and knowledge, Father. Lord, we pray for Robin this morning, Lord Jesus, that you would continue to touch her with this uh, vascular issue with veins, Father God, that you would be gracious to her and bring healing to her body in the name of Jesus. And, Lord, we also pray for their neighbor, Scott, that your hand would be extended towards him, Lord Jesus, in the midst of this biopsy and uh, diagnosis and things like that, Father, that your grace would be present. And, Lord, let Matt and Robin be a great witness, Lord Jesus, to them. Father, we pray for the lost, in, in, not only in this room or outside of this room, but lost family members, Lord Jesus. Uh, those, the Father, that need to call upon the name of the Lord for salvation. And, Father, I pray that your hand would be extended towards them. Put somebody in their way, Lord Jesus, that they can see the light. Lord, and you are the light, the truth, Father. Lord, we pray for uh, Richard and Geraldine's daughter-in-law, Lord God, and knee or ankle replacement surgery that's happening, Father. Be with her. Bring healing to her body. Be near to her in the name of Jesus, we pray. Father, we pray for Chris's aunt, Kathy. Lord, that you would touch her, bring healing to her body. Uh, Lord, in the unknown, I pray for peace. And uh, without diagnosis, I pray for peace in her body and peace in her mind. And, Lord, whatever was there would shrivel up and die and go away in Jesus' name. And, Father, we pray for Mark Smithers, mom's caregiver's family, Lord. They've experienced such loss and hardship, Lord Jesus, with uh, cancer riddling their family. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would touch them and bring healing to them. And, Father, cover over the whole family up. A blanket of peace and joy. And Father, we pray for Pastor Hammond this morning that you would touch him as he's having biopsies on his head, Lord Jesus. I pray that they come back and they come back uh, with a good report, Lord Jesus, that your hand would be extended to them. Father, I pray for uh, Leslie Christman's uh, uh, co-worker, Lord Jesus, Ivan. I pray that you bring a healing to his body, Lord Jesus, in the midst of this diagnosis of cancer. And, Lord, that your hand would be extended and that you would renew and that your grace would be enough, Lord Jesus, in this 
place, Father God, in this family, Lord Jesus, we pray. Father, we pray for uh, Billy's continued request, Father, that your hand would be extended for healing and for grace and the, the renewing of the body, renewing of the mind, renewing of the spirit in every way, Father. We pray for Lucy's family, for Gabe as the travels, Lord Jesus, and that you would be near them and be a protection over them and with them and all these things, Lord Jesus. Father, we pray for Brad this morning, Lord Jesus, that you would touch his body, Lord, that this blood infection would be removed and that it would go and whatever procedures are being done, Lord, that your hand would be extended towards him and that you would renew his body in the power of the name of Jesus. Lord, strengthen his faith through this situation, through this trial, and through this hardship, I pray in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would touch Julia Lee and that you would renew her body, Lord. Continue to touch her and strengthen her, Lord, and that the power of the Holy Spirit would be present in her body and in her life. Encourage her by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, and only the way that you can. Lord, we love you. We thank you that you hear from on high when we request of you. Lord Jesus, we pray this morning as we always pray that you would, Father, fill us with your Holy Spirit this morning and that you would show us where to cast our nets, Father. Bless every part of this day as we celebrate together and all of the needs in the midst of them, Lord, knowing that even as we celebrate that your presence is here with us and your presence is here with us to heal every need. And we give you praise for that in Jesus' name. And the church said together, Amen. 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 Would you stand? Let's worship the Lord this morning. So can we clap? Yeah. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. Is in heaven, right here in my heart. Here we go. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us. As we forgive the ones who sinned against us.
that I have this giant Hershey bar here. The kids are in service with us today, and so this is the Quiet Seed Prize, so if you're listening and paying attention, uh, you have eligibility to win uh, this prize, and that is if you're under the age of 50, by the way. Anyway, um, actually it's a little lower than that. <laughs> um, a few things before I introduce Pastor Joe, um, but... Um, you know, it's been said that the 20th anniversary of anything is a hard one to celebrate because it's too soon to brag, but it's really too late to complain. You know, it's, you're, you're just kind of in the, in the middle right there a little bit. And, uh, you know, for me, uh, the 20th anniversary of New Harvest marks this kind of continual movement towards maturity and health, I believe. Um, 
I've been your pastor uh, for a little over seven years, about about seven and a half years, and, and what a privilege it is, and, and what a privilege it is to have uh, people to serve with like, like we do, and I just appreciate Glory. you, I appreciate our congregation and everything about it, and so um, in the midst of a, a human lifespan, 20 years is a big deal, you know, 20 years is the age that you leave teenage uh, portion of life and move on to uh, you know, basically the fullness of adulthood. And so um, being mature is kind of where I see that same similar timeline of our church, that, that we are becoming mature. We are walking in the fullness of our calling and maturity that God has called us for. And Ephesians 4, of course, says that God gave uh, gifts to the church, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher, uh, so that we could be united in the faith, in the knowledge of Jesus and that we would become mature in all of Christ's fullness. Yes, and so that's why we're here, is to be mature and to become more mature, not only uh, uh, individually, but to become more collectively uh, mature. And so if you would, just for a moment, uh, we kind of did this at the worship team this morning, but, but think about where you were 20 years ago. Anybody want to volunteer that information? No. <laughs> where, you weren't here at all. Where are you, Jan? <laughs> Where were you 20 years ago? Again, not, not quite here yet. Yeah. I was 18 years old and graduating from Campbell County High School in Northern Kentucky. Uh, believe that or not. Anybody else? Come on, want to volunteer this information. Where were you? Ryan, where were you 20 years ago? I was about to have my first kid. Yeah. Cole. Yeah. Wow. I was in third grade. Third grade. <laughs> Very good. 20 years ago. Somebody else. Tell me where you were 20 years ago. It was Kim. Yes. 20 years ago, I was sitting in a, in a hotel, a lobby, uh, and Eli was the one that hit the home run. Yeah. It's incredible, isn't it? Amen. Amen. You were in Florida, yeah. yeah. 20 years ago. Incredible. Thank you for being here. This is Pastor Yolanda and Julio Diaz that are with us this morning. From uh, Iglesia Mana Familia, just across, uh, over on Teton Trail, uh, just across the way. Thank you all for being here with us today. Oh, what a blessing that is. And so, um, yes, Melanie. I was with Kim. You was with Kim <laughs> in the hotel lobby, that's right. <laughs> yes, amen. Amen. We're glad, and we're glad that there's some founding folks here today. Ayla, where were you 20 years ago? Middle school. Middle school. Oh, tough place to be, right? Amen. So just think about the maturity that's come over the last 20 years and how God changes. And let's just think about that for a moment and just let's thank him this morning for his faithfulness to us. God is a faithful God. And he's faithful to bring about the maturity and the fullness and fruition of his desires. So this morning I have the privilege to uh, uh, introduce to you our, our 20th anniversary speaker, um, and that is uh, Pastor Joe. Uh, or Dr. Joe Girdler, rather. Actually, the doctor's twain, actually, we have here today. One's a medical doctor, one's a ministry doctor. And uh, Dr. Joe Girdler uh, is my pastor, and uh, I serve on the Presbytery Board for this great uh, state of Kentucky. And Pastor Joe is, serves as my pastor and obviously the superintendent of the Kentucky Ministry uh, Network. And so uh, he has been a great influence to my life when I was... Um, about 18 years old, basically, uh, Pastor Joe was elected as the superintendent of the. I was in the district council. I was an intern at First Assembly of God in Alexandria, Kentucky, and I was right there. Now, you may not remember this, but I was troubled with where in the world, just after you got elected, I should go to Bible school. And I didn't know. I had visited North Central, I had visited uh, Evangel. And neither one of those seemed quite right. I unfortunately didn't visit Southeastern. I should have probably and would have been called there. But anyway, and I came up to you weeping in tears at district council and said, Pastor Joe, I don't know where I should go to school. And you prayed for me there, held my hands and prayed for me. And it's exactly what I needed at that point in time. I went away to school to Christ for the Nations and then, of course, several other schools. And here I am today. And I'm great, glad to be back in Kentucky and glad to be able to serve you and to have you and call you my pastor. So greatly appreciated that. Amen. One last thing that I wanted to announce to you is, is that Pastor Joe has brought many of his books 
uh, with this hymn today. Uh, they're discounted today for $10 a piece. There's a little receipt bag or basket out there. You can drop the money in if you need a receipt or if you want to send a check, you can just take a picture. The address is out there, uh, but all of his books are published. Um, uh, some of them I've read, some of them I have not, but I enjoy his writing, and so I'm sure you would enjoy that too. Would you welcome this morning Pastor Joe Girdler? So we'll start, uh, before we get going, one is it, it's always a privilege to be back at New Harvest. I feel like I'm at home when I come here, and so thank you for your warm reception to Renee and I. Uh, 20 years ago, we were still pastoring uh, Kingsway, uh, and then ultimately, uh, just in a matter of months from that, an 18-year-old kid, I, apparently I prayed for him. I pray, I'm glad it worked out for you. I'm glad it worked out for you. Glad it worked out. Uh, on behalf of the Assemblies of God USA, and on behalf of the Kentucky Ministry Network of the Assemblies of God, it is my privilege to present to your church and to pastor this 20th anniversary celebration plaque. So, um, if you want to... Congratulations, Pastor. God bless you. I also would uh, take the uh, privilege, if I can, I don't think Pastor would mind, uh, Dr. Bowman, excuse me, uh, but to just welcome today uh, Betty and Donna Herod. Uh, I have not seen them in 20 years, and uh, they were faithful members of the church Renee and I pastored, and they came to visit with New Harvest today. And so it's so good to see you all. Welcome again, and welcome to Kentucky and the New Harvest. I have not done this in a long, long time. My father-in-law was a jokester. Every sermon he would preach, he would begin with a joke. And uh, But I, I read this this week, and I laughed out loud. And I, I don't know about you, have you ever been in a season of your life where you needed a laugh? And uh, so I, I've been running a little bit slow uh, the last few weeks. I was in the hospital a few weeks ago, and, and uh, so I'm just kind of slowly getting back at it. Somebody asked me this morning, how are you feeling? I said, about 65. Uh, you know, that's about 65% right now is how I'm feeling. Uh, but I actually read this this week, and I chuckled out loud. So I'm going to begin with a joke in honor of my father-in-law who went on to heaven about 10 years ago or so. There were three boys. I hope you'll like this. I know you'll like this. There were three boys in a schoolyard that were bragging. I just heard a minute ago from the young lady about she loves her school. They were bragging about who had a better father. Now, next week's Father's Day. Anybody remember that? It's a reminder to you ladies. Next week's Father's Day. The first boy said, my dad scribbles a few words on a sheet of paper, and he calls it a poem, and they give him $100. Second boy said, my dad scribbles a few words on a sheet of paper and calls it a song, and they give him $1,000. Third boy scratched his head for a minute, and he just went ahead and chimed in. He said, well, my dad's even better than all that. He scribbles just a couple of words, erases them, and then writes a few more on a sheet of paper, and he calls it a sermon, and it takes six men to take up all the money for him. This morning, let's get to the word, which is why we're here. Yes, sir. There's one reason we gather, and his name is Jesus. Yes. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, and the end. Yes, sir. There is no other name. No, sir, There's no other reason. There's no other reason than Andy Timlin. And I knew him and 20 years ago when you all started your church, and it started in a, a living room, if I'm not mistaken. I had preached for Andy at his previous church, and he had come over to my church at Kingsway and sat down many times, and we talked and prayed together as he was dreaming about Frankfurt. Yes, sir. There's no other reason we gather but that we lift up Jesus. Glory. There's no degrees that you can put on a wall that mean anything at all. It's all about Jesus. Amen. It doesn't matter whether they call you this or that or doctor or whatever. It's all about Jesus. We're all just on a journey. The Bible tells us, Peter urges us, this isn't my key text, in 1 Peter, Peter says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who would ask of you, to give reason for the hope that is in you. Always be prepared to give reason for the hope that you have. Yes. Now, sometimes we, we walk through some tough times and we may not always have a lot of hope. 
We live in a society these days where it seems everybody's hopeless. I was in New York City last weekend and walked around and I couldn't help but notice everybody. I was, I happened one evening I was in an environment with a lot of, I'll call them very important people. You know, they are all dressed to the hilt and, and they all had titles and they had all this stuff and they had yeah. money and they had yeah. this, that and the other. But you could look in their eyes and just see that they were lost. Yes, you could look in their eyes and see they didn't know my God. They weren't, they weren't laying down at night with the same peace that I have. They live in a different world. They're just clueless. I saw a statistic not too long ago that said that so many of our soldiers have come home from the wars and come home from recent issues in Afghanistan and Iraq. And the suicide rate is just off the chart with, with soldiers that have come home. Why? Because they have no hope. Life is just so difficult right now. There's another statistic that says, and probably Dr. Bowman knows the number, but I don't exactly know it, but there's like, I don't know, there's a 1,000 or 1,700 ministers in America that are leaving the ministry every single week. Every week there's 15, 1,700 ministers that are leaving the ministry in America. Why? Because they have no hope. Life has just gotten so difficult. It's so challenging. It's just so tough these days. You look at our government and you just feel like you have no hope. You look at, I'm sorry, it doesn't matter whether you vote independent, Republican, Democratic. Renee says, don't go there, but I'm going to go there anyway. It doesn't really matter how you vote. The bottom line is, I look at all of them they're giving us to vote for, and I think, don't we have anybody better than that to vote for? Come on. Do we have anybody in America willing to lift up the name of Jesus and to stand on it who's smart enough to know how to live by the law? I don't know, but the Bible says to be prepared whatever situation you find yourself in, whatever situation it looks like in your health, whatever situation it looks like in your finances, whatever situation it looks like in your home, whatever situation it looks like at the funeral home when you walk past that loved one who died unexpectedly, like that 20-year-old girl that Renee and I read at funeral home this past week, and she died unexpectedly in her college dorm room this past week. How do you even overcome these kinds of hopeless moments? The Bible says be prepared prepared at all times to give an answer for the reason that in the middle of whatever you're walking through that you have some hope. My message today is just that. It's about hope. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Psalms chapter 33. And if you have anything to write on, I've only got five simple points. Somebody said a minute ago, you're supposed to have three points in a sermon. And I said, I'll leave that to Dr. Bowman. I'm going to give you five simple points. Five simple points today if you want to write them down, but let me, let me uh, set my microphone down just a moment and turn to the scripture. Psalms chapter 33. As I begin this morning, I'm going to begin with just a little bit of history. So the psalmist writes in Psalms chapter 32. This is the passages of scripture where you hear these things. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Chapter 34, you hear these things. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Yes. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name forever. For the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Yes. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. And the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears are toward their cries. My key text today comes from Psalms chapter 33, right sandwiched in between those. Beginning in verse 16. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. On those who hope in his steadfast love. 
that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in their famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Yes, for our heart is glad because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O oh Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you today for your goodness. I thank you for your faithfulness, O oh God. I thank you, Lord, that you're faithful. I thank you for Pastor Scott, my friend, and Rebecca. I thank you for how you've used them in so many ways. Lord, I thank you for this faithful congregation, oh God. I thank you, Lord, that in the good days or the bad days, the highs or the lows, money or no money, Lord, that there have been a remnant of people that have said, here am I, oh God, send us. And they've continued, oh God, to serve you faithfully day in and day out. I thank you for 20 beautiful years. And I ask, oh God, if you tarry the next 20, oh God, we'll see many more people enter the kingdom with us, oh God, that we might stand before your throne and hear you say, well done, new harvest, well done. Father, we commit this word to you now, and I ask, oh God, you would bless the presenter, oh God, that I might present you well. And I pray it in Jesus' name. And the church say, Amen. Pennsylvania born into poverty. Christian Missionary Alliance revivalist A.W. Tozer said, A whole new generation of Christians has come believing that it is possible to accept Christ without forsaking the world. Oh, wow. We live in a world today that Tozer predicted then. We live in a world today that everybody thinks they're going to heaven because they're a good person or because they love. How could a God of love send you to hell? All you have to do is have love is what the world sends to us today. Because can I tell you, hope must not be put in an other, another human being. You cannot put your hope in a person. I, I don't mind saying it and I've said it to her. And we just had our anniversary this week and I will say to Renee even publicly today, she's the best thing that ever happened to me. She is the joy of my life. She's my strength. I love her more than now than I've ever loved her in all my heart. But you know, I can't put my hope in her. When it comes right down to it, I can't get to heaven on her faith. I can't get to heaven on, on her prayers. I can't get to heaven. I can't make it through the tough times. I can't make it through those moments when you just feel like you're struggling because I put my hope in someone else that I love or someone that I trust. You cannot put your hope in another human being. And you cannot put your hope in material possessions. Yes, you can't put them in your bank account. You can't put them in the stock market. You can't put them in America. I don't know if I can preach the paint off the walls today, Pastor Scott, but I will give you what's in my heart. You cannot take to heaven whatever God happens to bless you with here. He blesses you with it here so that you might bless somebody else. Yeah. I heard the young lady say a moment ago, if you want to help somebody, come help us help somebody. But he blesses us that we might bless someone else. And in the meantime, sometimes he really blesses you. And we thank him for that because he's a good God and a faithful God. He takes care of you. There's nothing wrong with your new Cadillac. There's nothing wrong with the boat that you put on the ocean or on the, on the water sometime and go fishing. There's nothing wrong with a nice house and five bedrooms and ten bathrooms and whatever it is you want. Whatever your dream is, there's nothing wrong with it. But can I tell you, you can't take it to heaven with you. You may as well use it. If he gives it to you, you might as well use it for the kingdom and use it for somebody else that somehow you might draw them to a place that they might have hope. Psalm 20 says, some trust in chariots and some trust in horses. But I will trust in the name of the Lord my God. Matthew chapter 13 verse 44 is a beautiful description of faith in Christ. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all he had and he went and bought that field. 
Oh, the joy of the Lord. Whatever it takes to find that treasure. Once I've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, I recognize there's nothing else that's going to matter from that point. You can give me the biggest. You can give me the finest. You can give me the wealthiest. Just show me the presence of the Lord. And I am happy in his presence. I'm good to know that there's a treasure buried in the field. Hope is an important commodity. I haven't even started yet. I haven't even given you my first five points. <laughs> Hope is an important commodity. If you've ever been with somebody who's hopeless or in a place that seems hopeless, yes. even if you know it's not, but they might feel for them it seems that way. Yes, sir. It's a desperate place. It can be a very dark place. You almost have to be a caregiver. You have to encourage constantly and edify constantly just to get their mind out of that dark place. Hope is an important commodity. People have got to have hope. They've got to have hope. Hope is the invisible hand that leads you through that midnight hour. First Timothy chapter 1, Paul introduced himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus, our hope. I introduced myself, Paul said, as an apostle of Christ Jesus, our hope. Christianity is not a message, it's a lifestyle. The yeah. older I get, I'm more convinced it's caught, not taught. Right. So, I guess I should preach five points. You've got to go eat chicken in a minute. <laughs> Let me share with you five simple reasons why I have hope. Regardless of the valleys or regardless of whatever my world faces, here's five simple reasons that I jotted down a few years ago that I'm going to give to you today that why I have hope. I lay my head down at night sometimes in those dark places just like you. Sometimes there's those moments that Renee has to get me out of that place. That she has to just wake me up and say, it's going to be okay. We're going to get through this. We're going to walk through this. You know, sometimes we all walk through those moments, right? But every single night, I can assure you, I lay my head down at night full of peace. I wake up every morning full of peace. Yeah. I pray that whoever I'm preaching to today, whoever's online listening to us today, I pray that you can do the same. Because having the peace of God surpasses all understanding. Amen. Point number one, I have hope because my God is sovereign. Amen. I told you it would be really easy to write them down. Number one, I have hope because my God is sovereign. He isn't worried about your past. No. Isaiah 43 says, forget the things of the past. James chapter 5 says, the prayer of the faith shall save the sick. He didn't worry about what your past has been. He's not worried about all those situations that overcome you. My God is sovereign. The very nature of God himself. God knows what he's doing. Why do I have hope? My first point is that my God is sovereign. God knows what he's doing. He knows why he brought you to Kentucky. He knows why he has you here. He knows why you're going through whatever you're going through. He knows why you're facing whatever situations you're facing. You can put names on some of those situations. He isn't rattled by what's going on. I've often said the life of faith is lived at the deep end of the pool. Go ahead and jump in. The Holy Trinity hadn't called an emergency board meeting to try to discuss their next move. God is still on the throne. Yes, sir. And he's very much in charge. Yes. Psalms chapter 22 verse 14 says, In you our fathers put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. Amen. I want to remind you, he delivered them and he'll deliver you as well. God is always faithful. God is always holy. My God is sovereign. Number one, why do I have hope when I lay my head down at night? When I wake up and my eyes open in the morning, I have hope because my God is in control. My God is sovereign. He's in control of my life, whether I'm with a global Methodist or the Assemblies of God or whether I grew up Baptist where I grew up. My God's in control of it all. When I get to heaven, he's not going to look at the denomination or the name that I've got on the card. He's going to say, what you do with Jesus? Where are you with my name, my son? 
Jesus, my Holy One of Jesus who died on the cross. I'm so thankful that my God is in control of your life. He's in control, moms, dads. He's in control of your kids. They may or may not be quite where you would wish they could be at certain seasons of our journey where you, where your parents wanted you to be. The bottom line is my God is sovereign. You pray, you pray, you pray, and God directs the steps of the righteous. He takes care of those things far bigger than we understand. Point number two, I have hope. Because I know my God is working on my behalf. I have hope because I know my God is working on my behalf. Psalms chapter 32. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord does not count iniquity. And in whose spirit there is no deceit. He's working on my behalf. I may not have it all together, and I certainly am not perfect, and nobody in this building is. There's only yeah, one who's yeah. perfect, and his name is Jesus. Yes, sir. Oh, we're all on a journey, aren't we? We're all on a journey. We're all trying to figure it out. Sometimes people figure it out in a jail cell, and sometimes people figure it out in a pulpit. The bottom line is we're equal in God's sight. We're all on a journey. We're all trying to be more like him. We're all trying to live a little closer like him. And we're all trying to somehow attain his blessing and his honor and his goodness so that we might live eternally with our loved ones who have yes, called on him. Yes, we're all attaining and trying to go to the same thing, but he's working on your behalf. I tell people pretty often that, Keep moving forward because he's cheering you on. He's cheering you on. God is up there cheering you on. He's up there clapping for you, believing in you. He, no matter where you are, even if you are in the jail cell, he's cheering you on because he wants you to take one step closer to being like him. So that the thief, I love that story. There's two stories in the Bible that I love most of all. One is the, the father who stood on the front steps and he, he saw his son running. He'd been gone, you know, eating with the pigs. Y'all know the story. And his son was running back home, and the father ran out to meet him, put a robe on his back, shoes on his sandals on his feet, and a ring on his feet. Kill the fatted calf. We're going to celebrate. My son has come home. I love that story. I love that story. Second story that I genuinely love in all the Bible. It's a thief on the cross. He never served the Lord. He blasphemed the Lord and hated the things of God. He was a thief, a stealer, a robber. He cursed every other, drank every other, you know, whatever, whatever. Just put whatever you want to put in there. But that particular day, something happened in his heart. Yes, sir. And as he was, he was dying on that cross, he looked over and he said, Surely you are the Son of God. And the Father, my Father, your Father, looked at him and said, Today, you will be with me. Oh, that's powerful stuff, brother. That's powerful stuff. I love that story. Why? Because my God is cheering me on. Why do I have hope? Point number two, because I've got hope because my God is working on my behalf. He wants me to succeed. He wants me to see the blinded eyes open, no matter what my situation is, so that I could just acknowledge him as the hope of all eternity, so that he could bless me unlike I'd ever known before. The scripture tells me, and we know that all things, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Yes, Pharaoh likely thought he was in charge of the Israelite slaves in Egypt. Then Moses showed up, and God was working. God is at work in all situations yes. and in all circumstances. Luke chapter 1 verse 37 says nothing is impossible with God. Amen. Why do I have hope? Number one, I have hope because my God is sovereign. Number two, I have hope because I know he's working on my behalf. Yes, sir. Number three, I have hope because my God has given me his word. My God has given me his word. My father died. Uh, in 2004, just before, a month or two before, Renee and I were elected as superintendents. And uh, my father uh, was a wonderful Baptist brother. Uh, he uh, grew up in the Baptist church, stayed in the Baptist church, and that's where he raised me. He always taught me this. He said, Joe, 
He never understood. I still kept the letter that he wrote me in college when, when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I ended up in an Assembly of God church. And my, my father wrote me a letter and told me how he don't know how he had ever made such a mistake. And uh, he was praying for me that I would make it back to the Lord and that I had joined the cult, but he loved me, you know, he, whatever, whatever. I smile as I think back on those days. Yes, sir. I smile to think when I enter heaven with my father how he's going to run like that daddy standing on a porch. I smile at the goodness of God because my God is sovereign and because my God is working for me. Point number three, I've got the hope because of God's word. My father always taught me, Joe, I can't always give you money and I can't always teach you these things. But I can tell you this, let your word stand true. When you, when you do a business deal, he always taught me this as a kid, when you do any kind of a business deal, he goes, you look them in the eye and shake them, their hand firmly, he would say. Shake their hand firmly and look them in the eye. You know how many people we, we see today in today's society, they can't look you in the eye. Right. You talk to people, a lot of teenagers today, I notice that, maybe they've just not been taught sometimes, or, yeah. but they just look at the ground all the time. They kind of look at the ground. You talk to them, they kind of look at the ground. My father right. taught me even as a kid. If an adult talks to you, you stand up straight, you look them dead in the eye, and you shake their hand. He said, now as you get older, your word, let your word be true. If you say you're going to mow that yard on Thursday, then you mow it on Thursday. Don't you mow it on Friday? They're expecting you on Thursday. You mow it on Thursday. If you say you're going to do it for $10, don't charge them 12 You told them it'd be 10 Let your word be your word. You know, those simple little things. I'm so thankful that my father, God, gave me his word. He gave me his word. Why do I have hope, David, when I lay my head down at night? I have hope because my God gave me his word. He gave me his word. Adriana asked the preacher, how do you write a book? Easy, the preacher said. All you have to do is write the beginning and then write the ending. Then just fill in all the spaces in between. Well, the beginning I know and the ending I know. But the middle is where I'm living now. And it can sometimes leave me without any answers and without any understanding. It's the middle that messes me up every single time. You can be assured, my friends, God is writing history through you to get you to the end. No matter what happens in your life, his word stands true and you can count on its promises. Yes, Psalms chapter 119 says it this way, your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. And he has a plan to see his great commission fulfilled. Mark chapter 16 says it this way. You are to go into all the world and preach good news to everyone, everywhere. And I've learned in the journey, his purpose for me is to tell others. Romans chapter 10 says it this way. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? The gospel, my friends, is the reason New Harvest is here. And the gospel is only good news if it gets there first. I encourage you, take the gospel first and foremost in every aspect of your life. Live the gospel, take the gospel, share the gospel, be the gospel. Sometimes you might be the only Bible they will ever read. Let them read your life well. If you have to use words, use them. But may you be the gospel in front of a loss in a very confused society yes, today. Yes. I have hope because... God's word. God's word is the voice of God. Smith Wigglesworth said, years ago I was doing ministry in England and I had the privilege one evening, never forgotten it, I had the privilege one evening to sit down in the living room and have tea and biscuits, little cookies 
with some extended family members of Smith Wigglesworth, and they were they did not know him. He had, of course, died many, I don't know, 100 years ago. He died a long time ago. But they were sharing stories that had been passed down in their family of Smith Wigglesworth. Smith Wigglesworth said, you will never know the mind of God. Until you learn to know the voice of God. Yeah. And in that midnight hour, in those dark moments, standing before that casket, yeah. in those days that somehow you're just not sure you have the energy anymore, that's when you hear the voice of God. Yeah. That still, sweet, small voice. Sometimes it rumbles loud and clear like the rumbling of the thunder. And other times it's a still small voice that speaks to your spirit. And you know exactly what to do. You know exactly what to stand on. You know exactly where to go. Why? Because he is still speaking and his voice is still speaking to you. Why do I have hope, my friends? I'm only going to give you five. Here's three of them. Number one, my God is sovereign. Number two, he's working on my behalf. And number three, I'm convinced that his word is true and I can stand on it. Glory. Number four, I have hope because the light shines the brightest in the darkness. I have hope because the light shines the brightest in the darkness. Every storm runs out of rain eventually. <laughs> what most see is troubled times. We as believers in churches should see as opportunities. Sometimes the greatest testimonies come from when things had seemed to be going wrong. Our disappointment becomes God's divine appointment. I've used the analogy many times. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I had the privilege to be in Africa. I stood in a Maasai tribe in front of Maasai village warriors, and, and we prayed one for another and prayed together as, as this, this tribe had been Christianized, and they were faithfully serving the Lord. They had a Maasai, uh, that's not what I'm getting ready to tell you, but this is an anecdote. Renee says I chase rabbits all the time. And uh, this, this Maasai tribe, they had a Maasai warrior that was a pastor. Uh, he was a, a, matter of fact, he was affiliated with the Assemblies of God. Can you believe it? <laughs> in middle, Af middle Africa. I said, what affiliation? You have affiliations out here. How's that work? Uh, you know, and then a translator, they asked if I'd ever heard of the Assemblies of God. Oh, I've heard of them, yeah. <laughs> okay. Years ago, though, I, I was in Ecuador, deep in the jungle, and it was pitch, pitch dark. Had likely been with, I was with a tribal group. It was like National Geographic. We were so far out. We had gone as far as you could go on a boat, and then we got on these hollowed out. I don't even know the word for them, but I don't know what they're called. But they're hollowed out canoes, you know, like a big log, and they hollow them out. And uh, several of our people had to get in those, and, and the tribal people would, would take us further down and, we finally got to this little village that we were going to to, to share the gospel. We were going to preach a revival campaign there. We were going to show the Jesus film back in the day. Do you remember when they were showing the Jesus film? Everywhere? That particular night, our people, we got out. We pulled out the generator. And we said it was pitch dark, you know, six at night, and it's in the jungle, and it's pitch dark. And we pulled out the generator, and uh, they pulled out the, uh, the box of lights that we had brought with us. And, and I, I don't know why, I just kind of brought back nostalgic memories, the box of lights. We opened it up. And, and then you remember the, when I was growing up in the 1960s, Christmas tree lights, they weren't these dilly-dally little tiny things you buy at Walmart these days. Christmas tree lights were these monster bobbies. You know what I'm talking about, right? You know what I'm talking about. Right? They were these monster lights. The Christmas tree lights were these big monster lights. And then we opened up this thing, and it was a big, long... You know, you could circle this thing two or three times, but it was a big, long light of those, I call them big old Christmas tree lights. And they plugged it all in, they plugged it into the generator, and they strung the lights up around the trees, and the lights came on. All of a sudden, you could just see the miraculous in the eyes of the indigenous people. They had never seen electricity, and they'd never seen lights. And you saw the lights string all around the trees, and they just stood in wonder and in amazement. I mean, you could have stopped right there and given an altar call probably. You know, Skip the move, you know what I'm saying? But they were just so enamored with the lights. Yes, sir. 
looking at that strand of lights, what we might consider Christmas tree lights, I guess. Man-made electricity reminds me that Jesus is the light of the world. Amen. He does shine brighter in the darkness. And when somebody is in that hopeless place, and we're in that dark moment, we're in that heavy moment, and we're in that funeral home moment, or in that hospital moment, or they're in that lawyer's office at a bankruptcy moment, or they're in that lawyer's office at a divorce moment, or they're somehow in that moment that they just can't understand how they ended up here. All it takes is in the middle of pitch darkness to plug in the generator and let the lights begin to shine. And oh, you don't even have to say too much, just the amazement of a light. Church, can I tell you when I lay my head down at night, the amazement of the goodness of God. Oh, the amazement of the light. I just am still enamored and amazed like the first time I got saved. I got saved in college. I was at UK, and I hadn't been serving the Lord. I got saved. And, oh, just the joy of the Lord, just the amazement of the light. Don't ever lose that amazement, church. Don't ever lose that amazement. Sometimes you have to show the film. Sometimes you have to tell them a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But sometimes you just got to show them the light. Because Jesus draws every mind into him, every heart into him. You just show him the light, and Jesus draws them straight to him. Why do I have hope? Number one, I have hope because my God is sovereign. Number two, I've got hope because he's working on my behalf. Number three, I've got hope because of his word, and I can stand on it. Number four, I've got hope because the light shines brightest in the darkness. After your season of suffering, God in all of his grace, my friends, he will restore, he will confirm, he will strengthen, and he will establish you. 1 Peter chapter 5. Let the light in you shine brighter than the light on you. Maybe I need to say that one more time. Let the light in you shine brighter than the light on you. My last point is this, worship team, if you come, you just I'll just keep on preaching unless you help me to. You sing, you sing me on out because it's all good for you. You sing me on out. Point number five is this. I have hope. I have hope because my God never leaves me alone. Deuteronomy chapter 31, it says it this way. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. I have hope because my God never leaves me alone. God works out this thing called life for me. There are days you might not feel it. There are days you might not feel close to it. There are days you might not sense that he's near. There are days that somehow you might not feel like you want to get out of bed that day and do it again. But can I tell you, you can rest on his promise. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I hope in God, and I find assurance that God's grace and his deliverance is sure. I hope in God and I find assurance that the sufferings on earth will end and redemption and resurrection will occur. I find hope in God and I have assurance that an eternal house in that city whose architect and builder is God is already prepared for me. It's already waiting for me. And it's asking that I might say, surely you are the son of God. I have hope in God and I find assurance for the blessed assurance. I might be old school, you don't hear it preached too much, but I still believe in the rapture of the church. I'm still old school enough to, to believe that before I go through too much tribulation, tribulation, he's going to sound the trumpet and he's going to call me home. Just like he protected Noah, just like he protected his family before the terrible thing came, I think he's going to take care of me. I'm totally convinced that he never leaves me alone and he's looking out on my behalf. Yes, sir. I end with this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend. I wholly lean on 
Jesus' name. Stand with me, please. Father God, I thank you for Pastor Scott and Rebecca again and their family. I thank you for the New Harvest family, New Harvest family oh God. I thank you, oh God, for what you're doing in this place. And I thank you, God, that I got a small part of being a part of it when it began. And yes. these 20 years later, I have the privilege of standing with friends one more time to say thank you, God, for your goodness. Lord, today I'm reminding any who have come to this house that feel that they're in a dark moment. They feel they're in a heavy place. Maybe they feel, oh God, or they're listening online and they feel that they've lost their hope, oh God. I want to remind us, God, that you are faithful. I thank you, God, that you are good. You are faithful and you are righteous. And Lord, today we lift our, our eyes to you. We lift our hands to you. We lift our voices to you. Lord, if there's any in this house that do not know you as their Lord and Savior, I ask today that today would be the day of salvation. I would be remiss if I did not at least give an opportunity for someone here today to renew their relationship with Christ. Maybe you've walked away from the Lord. Maybe you're not where you need to be, but you're saying, I know that I can stand on his hope. I know I can stand there. I know I can believe for my tomorrows. Maybe you're here and no one really knows, or maybe you're online and you're listening. Just stop right where you are and pray these prayers with us. But maybe you're here and you would say, I want Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I've never given him my full heart and my full life, and I want to accept him as my Savior. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to offer this prayer. I'm going to say one, two, three, and it's a point of three. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And if that's you, I want you to just raise it to the Lord and say, Pastor, pray for me. Pastor, pray for me. I want to be closer to the Lord. I want to come back to the Lord. I want to give my life to the Lord. If you're wanting to give your life to the Lord for the very first time, I'm going to ask you to step out and come down forward and meet your pastor here. Let him pray for you. Just step out into the small aisle. Just step out and come to Pastor Scott. Let him pray for you. Father God, number one. Number two. Lord, if there's any at all, let today be their day of, of hope. Number three. Any at all. Any hands in the house at all. Number three. Father God, we bless you. We honor you. And we worship you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, Amen. 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 Um, we are going to in just a few moments, we're going to disband so that we can go to, we're going to eat down here instead of in the pavilion, just so you know. Um, so I uh, just want to uh, make sure that you know that. And uh, would you give Pastor Joe a hand and thank him for being here with us. Amen. But I'm going to pray, and uh, we are going to bless the food and just bless this day. And Quiet and we're going to do the quiet seat prize before I do that, okay? So, Ms. Kim. She's our, they were good. They did good. Good job, guys. Excellent. We're going to pray over the meal and pray over the, the rest of the service, but also uh, remember tonight at 6 p.m., um, if Pastor Joe was actually sitting on the pews of First Assembly of God in Lexington, Kentucky with Father Charles Howe, believe that or not. And Father Charles will be here tonight at 6 p.m. to speak. That? Yes, absolutely. I was, telling, I was telling Renee coming here, I knew that Pastor Father Howe was coming tonight. And uh, I, I remember like it was yesterday, uh, uh, Charles and I, I like Charles, but uh, we, we were young students, we were college-age students. Uh, just trying to find Jesus, you know. And Charles attended the same church that Renee and I attended, the church I got saved in. And uh, every Sunday morning, he would be right there with us, uh, us worshiping the Lord together. Of course, he's gone on with the Catholic faith. And Charles is a genuine brother. And I know you're going to bless be blessed tonight by his word. Let's pray today. Father, we give you praise and thanks, Lord Jesus, uh, for this opportunity to celebrate. Lord, as we break bread this afternoon, Lord Jesus, we pray that you bless and nourish this food to our bodies as we celebrate with one another the great things and the faithfulness that you have done and been in our lives, Lord Jesus. And we pray that you would just continue to touch us, touch uh, Father Charles tonight as he brings the word, Lord Jesus, to us, and just bless this afternoon, Lord God, as we fellowship and commune with one another. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Now, we're not finished yet. <laughs>
I'm going to see if we can still remember how to clap. Gospel people's going to do what we do. We get full. Yeah. We'll see you at the pavilion. <laughs> oh, we are? We're okay. Sounds good. Y'all go to the pavilion?